um, we're going to get back to it, but I'm, I'm, I'm just so interested in this notion that the $6 million investment and these impact expectations that you all were willing to pivot so readily. Um, uh, uh, can we bring on all of the uh, panelists for a little Q&A? Let me change my view here so I can see you all better. Thank, thank you, thank you for all of that. Um, one of the questions that I had, and it's a question that came from the audience as well. Um, uh, Abby just mentioned culture being uh, uh, the number one metric. And uh, uh, most of you all referred to the importance of culture. When Donna was speaking, uh, somebody said, well, how do you measure culture? Donna, I think uh, no fewer than two times, you talked about um, uh, the need to respect culture. And uh, we wanted to know, how do you respect culture? How do you measure that? How do you manage it? How do you ensure that it's, uh, it's, it's ex executed upon? And I'd love each of you all to answer that in your own way. Well, um, in our organization, we have something called operating principles that I already mentioned, and it's based on cultural values and beliefs of the, the people we serve. So we can measure our operating principles <clears throat> to make certain that we're meeting those. And some of the, the ideas in there are relationship. They want to be in relationship um, with their provider team. Uh, they want to be seen when they want to be seen. So that that's access. Um, they want to feel um respected and involved in their decision making. So those are all questions we can ask, you know, pretty easily, you know, did you get an appointment when you wanted an appointment? Did you feel respected? Um, and then we, we definitely ask, do you feel your culture was respected? So we ask that almost every single visit. So we get a lot of data points on that um, to make certain that we're doing that. We also, there's indirect measures, you know, in terms of um, when somebody is impaneled to a team, how often do they leave that team or do they just stick with that team? So you, you can tell, you know, uh, people who are meeting the needs of the, um, the people we serve. So just lots of different ways um, to look at that. And, and um, as I mentioned, we build it into the work we do and make certain that everybody is um, educated on the expectations of our organization in terms of um, the cultural values and beliefs. And did you all ever find, your, find yourself ha having to pivot or react or respond differently because there, there was a sense that culture wasn't being respected? And, it, and if so, how did you respond or pivot? It's usually on an individual basis. You know, if somebody comes in and, and they don't really understand the cultural cultures very well, and um, they might not do as well. Um, as somebody who uh, understands the culture. So that's one of the reasons we have that education program for um, all of our employees so that they, they do understand and they get training around this um, and how to interact with people who are different um, than you. Um, we also make certain that we hire uh, the correct people. I mean, that's where it starts, who you hire. So if you hire somebody who doesn't wanna be a part of the team who knows um, nothing about Alaska Native cultures and has no desire to know anything about Alaska Native culture, uh, you know, we're probably not gonna hire that person. So they have to feel like a good fit to our organization before we'll hire somebody. So it starts before you even hire. And if somebody's not doing well, we put lots of support around them. We have mentors that work with them. Um, the managers are, are also aware of these issues and are ready to intervene. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of steps you can take to help somebody be successful because that, that is something we want. We want our employees to be successful. So if somebody's struggling, we put a lot of support around them. I can jump in. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think we, we think a lot about community culture and community culture can be at um, a neighborhood level from block to block. Um, it can also uh, be more broad. We, of the six communities that we've been deeply um, in relationship with, we have everything from a highly urban 
uh, setting, uh, bridging two urban centers together um, to these highly localized pockets um, with 10,000 people, but even within those pockets, um, neighborhood captains and, and sort of uh, block by, by block. And when I talk about culture through this place-based work, it's, you know, I, we think a lot about this group dynamics and um, uh, Donna spoke to, to this is, those core values or guiding principles or simple rules that we can all agree on. And it's, uh, it's more about the process than, uh, and the journey than it is the end. And uh, that has been uh, one of our key takeaways that once you see, you can't unsee. So it really has uh, entered into all aspects of our work at the foundation, but also um, among the nonprofit partners and system partners who are participating in this work, um, where we're beginning to see some real cultural change at an organizational level and how um, folks create those spaces to really um, co-create with community. Mary or Gloria, do you have anything else to add to culture? Okay, I can add something to culture. Here, where I am in Drew, Mississippi, I guess I am the culture, I guess that's what it is. But I left uh, Drew, Mississippi, and I came back after 20 to 30 years. So when I came back, I learned that I had changed in a way that some people didn't understand. Or, mm -hmm. And also, I had to learn to speak the language of the people all over again. I had to learn to speak and not to say uh, foundation uh, words, because I work for a foundation, not to use those words such as ecosystems. And uh, they don't even really know if the word culture comes to them. You ask them, okay, what, what does culture mean? It's like, it's something that's not really known about culture, okay? And also uh, when you talk about social equity, health equity, Try not to use those words because they're like, what is social equity? What does that mean? You know, you have to learn to speak like they do again. And, and a lot of times when I would talk to my uh, staff member, she's a young person that lives here in Drew, Mississippi. And I would ask her, what, what, what do people think about this in Drew, Mississippi? So I'd question and try to find out before I step out there too far on a limb and saying things and asking them to do things. That's going to be a really... Uh, against the way they do things, the norms or whatever here. So, so it's been an interesting journey to come back and say, okay, how do how do I handle this? And I, I've learned people have told me, you know, that we don't do we don't do it like that here or whatever. Or you sound too demanding and things like that. And we don't know enough about that. You need to explain what you're talking about and don't use those words that we've never heard and those kinds of things. So I listen to the community and, and, and try to go back to where I came from, really. Do you want to add to that, Mary? I see you reaching. Yeah, I had difficulty finding the mute button. Well, no, I also, <laughs> I get confused between my iPad and I'm just tapping a screen that wouldn't respond to me. Um, <laughs> I'll just very briefly back up what Gloria was just saying in that um, I think using the community-based researchers, and I want to do it more in other aspects of my work, and how we've been bringing in more folks, is that I think what Gloria's talking about is the way we talk about jargon. It's not that people can't understand what an ecosystem or culture is. It's most people don't talk like researchers and foundation people most of the time, right? I mean, even you sit around, you go, I go to my hometown and talk to people, I'm like, wait, wait a minute. I sound like a wonk. Um, and so I think you, having the community-based researchers is sort of reminds me to explain, like, you know, even the word, Gloria's right, the word equity, things like that, it's fairness. You know, if you talk to people about fairness, they understand what you're saying. Um, that's the average person, but especially with the cultures within communities. And, it, and I think a lot of the cultural work that I've seen, like through 11th Street Bridge Park or Bread for the City, the partners that I've worked with in other respects, it comes down to how the community feels and smells and sounds like what music is playing and things like that too. I mean, a lot of the cultural equity work being done by 11th Street Bridge Park is about is, is the dis, you know, the displacement and gentrification we're seeing in Ward 8 these days. Um, is it displacing the culture before it even displaces the people? And so I've been looking at techniques like windshield, you know, surveys 
things like that about what are the cultural markers, what makes this feel like your place, uh, and and taking them over time to see if that that those markers are changing. Especially with the bridge park, it's going to be a park that's on a bridge, so it'll be very you know easy to programmatically even evaluate that is what sort of musical things are being booked even, you know? So, I mean, there's levels, but in, in the Thrive survey, again, the community-based folks were, were a check on us as, as much as anything else, but the kinds of issues the others are talking about in the context of the pandemic for Thrive weren't, weren't as active. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks, 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 Mary. Hey, Gloria, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, I, I found your story really interesting because you're obviously in the middle of trying to revitalize this community. And uh, if I understood the narrative, it sounds like you're still in the middle. Um, you're, you're asking the community for solutions or have you gotten to a point where you feel like you're actually implementing the solutions? And uh, if so, I'm wondering if you're beginning to measure those solutions, but I, I wanna ask a bigger question. And that is if you've developed some solutions and ideas and gotten feedback from the community, and now I'm going to sound like a foundation walk, have you developed a theory of change and have you de de developed an idea of how you're going to bring about change? Uh, let me see. The first part of your question was about the successes and are we implementing? Yes, we are. And we are implementing exactly or not maybe not exactly, but we're implementing what the community came forward and say, this is what we need in our community. And the community came forward and said, we want some action to happen in our community. So we've had lots of people come to our community. They may drop a few dollars and they, they, they come and look and do tours and they leave and nothing ever changes. And so we want some change. And if you're not here to help us impact and make some change and get some things done, then we, we don't necessarily want that. We want, we want to see something. And so, yes, they're seeing something. The things that they ask for, they're seeing that. They ask for classes. They ask for transportation. They ask for health care. They ask for access to food. We're, we're going strictly by that strategic plan and saying, this is what the community said they want. So that's what we're going. we got recreational spaces now. They ask for ch our children need to play. Just the basic things that you have in the community that you take for most people take for granted. We want those things in our community. And so we're doing that in our community. Now, some of the things we check it off as we get done and we say, hey, you know, you, you see any differences? Yeah, we see we see the differences. So we we, we have done that. Now, the second part of your question was remind well, me. Yeah. Well, yeah, the second question of my the second part of my question was and I, I'm looking at Abby when I, I asked this question as well. When gathering, uh, you know, when, when being in the impact investment space. I think of theory of change. We develop a theory of change and we begin making interventions accordingly. And you know, we hope to have the systems approach. And I was just curious thinking to the extent you're responding to the community and listening to the community and responding, uh, can you put in a theory of change? How does that work uh, in terms of uh, trying to have the impact that you're trying to have? Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. It makes sense to me. And yes, I do have a, a theory of change. When I came back to Drew, Mississippi, I had a theory of change because I know I work for a foundation and they were the, the funding world was talking about things not working in, in, in spite of all the money that we put in this place, that nothing's changing. And so we're not going to invest in those places again. And so I'm asking the question, so what do you, why are you, do you think that this is not working and why your money is not paying off? And the answer was, well, until those people change their way of thinking, nothing's going to change. So my question was, well, who's working on helping them change their way of thinking? Well, that's too hard to do. So we were talking about mental models and mindsets and what's possible and giving people a reason to dream, giving people a reason to uh, think in terms of what they want to create rather than what they want, don't want and changing in that and, and, and having classes around self-worth and uh, life skills, all those things to change the way people think, to change, give people some hope, to change uh, what people think are pos is possible. And the way you do that, you also, you not only talk to them about possibilities, 
you show them some possibilities. You show them that if you ask for something, you want something and you have enough determination to work on it together, you can get it. And so when we did, the, um, for example, when we did the playground in, in Drew, there was not a playground in the whole community. And so they said, we want a playground, but we don't have enough money to get a playground. So we're not going to think about a playground. So I said, we got to change the way you think. We want a playground. We're going to find a way to do it. And we found a way to do it. We don't just say we can't have it because we never had it. We start to think it's possible in terms of what we can do and then show some things. There was another thing that we had, we, we did in the community. We did a downtown, they wanted downtown lifted up and downtown has been lifted up since we started this work. We have a pavilion downtown where now the community get together, have concerts. We do Juneteenth, we do Drew Day, we celebrate our holidays. We do all of that because the people believe that we can have it. So you gotta have people to believe that they can have what they want. And we talk about, I do, we do the mindfulness, we do the meditation, we also do, I do the law of attraction, all of that stuff. If you really want it, there's a way to get it. I'm here for a reason. I came back here for a reason. And, when, and now that I'm here and you all are here, we are gonna work together and we're gonna create whatever we wanna create and change that thought like I can't to I can. That's my theory. That's the only way you're going to change. You have to believe you can have it. You have to believe that your community can change. Because if you don't think you can do it, then you're not going to ever do it. Every action begins with a thought. And so I say, let's think about what do we want. And, and, and if we need to bring somebody else in, then we bring somebody else in. We don't have to do it all ourselves, but it can be done. And it. so that's 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 what I believe. Because they kept saying, well, they, they got to change their way of thinking. Nothing's going to change. But nobody wants to work on it. And that then after that, nobody wants to find that type of work. So, so you know, I like, this is what I'm doing. But no, nah, we want to know how many of these, how many of those you can count. It's, it's about life yeah. and the way life works. Gloria, I want to come visit the Delta. Uh, yeah, come visit to the Delta. Come to Drew. <laughs> come to Drew. Uh, and Abby, what do you think about, uh, do, you, do you have a theory of change? And how do you think about it in the context of, you know, also gathering, you know, coming in with preconceived notions, but then gathering input from the community. Well, it, we came in with an incredibly detailed theory of change, to your point. And within the probably first two years, uh, it, it went away. We just moved it aside. And that, let me just tell you, internally at the foundation, that was not an easy process. There was a lot of professional risk. Uh, and I have mapped the, um, the, the board discussions over uh, the course of uh, seven years. Uh, and that has been um, deep movement. Um, and a, a lot of credit going to uh, people who are removed, right, from this work. So part of um, our uh, getting rid of our um, very detailed theory of change and broadening this work was um, really became about relationships and getting board members and our committee members to be part of the change process um, and bearing witness to these community conversations. But I have to say, you know, even uh, with an invitation to the community to really design or to name their challenges and then to design solutions it took several years. Uh, so our, our foundation, the investment was a million dollars over five years and uh, $200,000 a year. Every single community rolled over at least half those funds in the first year and um, a little bit less in the second year because it took time to really adjust uh, and, and challenge what we're all conditioned for. If there's a funder in the room, that they tend to have the positional power and authority. But time and time and time uh, of showing up and really pushing the conversation back to the community and resourcing them when they had barriers. So if it was, uh, Gloria's a great um, example of, if they wanted a playground, let's think about a playground. And it to show that progress and to show that there, our commitment is real and let's bring other resources to bear to make that happen. Um, so we have another, uh, uh, many, many examples of, uh, of those steps. It's such an iterative process in that relationship development and to show those wins, um, both you know, as abstract as they can be, like measuring hope or what we talk a lot about is the belief that things can change. Uh, 
and Darren Hicks has a, a tool that I can drop in the in the chat. Had I known about it early on, I would love to incorporate it around authenticity. Um, so this this has really helped us uh, translate um, into who we are as a foundation and the control of resources and power and privilege that we hold in this community and to really within our um, own sphere of influence among the funding community are really wrestling together. Um, somebody just mentioned trust-based uh, philanthropy. It's something we wholeheartedly um, embrace. And I also wanna recognize that language um, is uh, really important. And we have um, six project directors in these communities who help us translate. Um, and what we have done is we have, um, our, one of our simple rules or mantras is we invest in people. So we have invested in people who wanna be change agents um, formally. Uh, be paid to do this. And for instance, we have complex facilitators who are residents leading uh, and facilitating conversations in community and leading these sense-making sessions. And the foundation doesn't need to be in the room. So it really is uh, community-based um, work. Yeah, in, in, in a similar vein, I'm gonna follow up um, your comments, both Abby and Gloria, and uh, especially Abby, but there's a question that came in from one of the attendees, which is relevant. It says, uh, how did each of the panelists learn to how, how to accept their own implicit bias before they decided to engage their target audience? As we know, cultural acceptance starts with self before we can meet our communities where they are now. And uh, I'd love to hear from Donna and Mary in particular in that regard. Uh, uh, both Gloria and Abby kind of touched upon how they had to overcome uh, uh, their own prior assumptions or their own prior language and expectations. Uh, but Donna and Mary, how might you answer that question? How you overcame any implicit biases that you may have had? I'll be honest, I'm not sure I have completely. I mean, I think that part of how you overcome it is being self-reflective and honest about it. Um, you know, I got called in the chat even about using the term using community-based researchers earlier. And I think I was mostly said instead of working with. Well, I don't know where that came from in my brain. Was I nervous? I think I was just nervous and careless with my words. But I have to be not defensive about that comment and self-reflective because I am a person with a very privileged background. I mean, I if I told you guys all the privilege I had enjoyed in my life, it would, I, it would be shocking to you. And the thing is, is that I need folks like community-based researchers who will work with me and I need to listen to them and their lived experience. I need to listen to the Gloria Dickersons who are able to come from their uh, position in community I do think the movement, besides trust-based philanthropy, I'm wholeheartedly for the movement about leadership of people of color and who come from experiences um, of, uh, in the communities that we're working in. I mean, that's one of the things Urban Institute is really working on is how do we create career ladders? That's why I'm on a team looking at the career ladder for community-based researchers. And it's raised a raft of issues, even how we had to hire the community-based researchers one of the places the term using might have come from is that I had to hire them, I, you know, as consultants. But then that raises a whole bunch of equity issues in terms of benefits, tax law. There were trainings that we enrolled the community-based researchers in that were the same as the sort of benefits cliffs trainings we enrolled the participants in as to how to think about any money we were giving them as gifts against because they have benefits too. So. I mean, the raft of issues that one has to deal with, I think you're never, you, you can't say you're ever done with it. And again, I think you put in place internal quality reviews too, to make sure that anybody's particular biases in an evaluation aren't coming into play. So there's a lot of techniques here, but from a personal perspective, I've just had to learn to, you know, listen, be open. And to say, I still have a role to play in evaluation and research in, in communities uh, that are disinvested, because that's what I work in mostly, um, but that I have to reposition how I think about myself in my own studies even, and cultivate, you know, good leaders make new leaders.
a cultivator should can take over me when, when uh, it's, it's, it's appropriate, appropriate for me to set aside and let other voices and other perspectives lead. Thank you for that candor, Mary. How about you, Donna? Well, bias, I think all of us have a bias right. of, of some type and all of us actually do have implicit bias too, just accidentally, you know, some, we say something, we do something and it really wasn't what we meant, but it, it can be perceived differently or it could be, you know, based on our own internal biases. I, I think that, um, you know, each of us also has tons and tons of strengths. And so we bring a lot of strengths to this table. As we're, we're seeing, I, you know, I'm listening to all these wonderful people speaking and I'm, I'm learning from each of you and I am so appreciative of that. So when we all come together and we share our strengths, um, I think that's really important um, because the end product or whatever we're working on is gonna be better if we're listening to each other. And I think that helps get over biases because um, we recognize the positive things that people bring. Yes, there's biases, but we also have to have the courage to, to say something. You know, if somebody says something or does something that doesn't quite resonate, we have to be able to say something and not mean, you know, not attack, um, but actually have a conversation. You know, use inquiry, ask more questions. Did, you know, what do you mean by that? When you said this, you know, <clears throat> what were you thinking? So I think it's, you know, coming up with um, tools to, to actually, you know, overcome those biases because, because we, we all do it. And, you know, what Glory was talking about is, you know, having, coming back after being gone for a, a lot of years and having to learn to communicate with people in her community. And she's from that community, you know, that resonates with me. You know, I, I'm here, I'm working in a healthcare setting. I'm a medical doctor, but I'm also an Athabascan woman. And so when I go to my village, you know, I change how I act, I change how I talk, and I still, you know, have to uh, learn things and be reminded of things. And, and fortunately, where I'm from, people are, are very gracious, and they also have a great sense of humor, so I get laughed at a lot. So <laughs> you just got to be able to go with the flow. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask you one last question before your very last question. This is the penultimate, but uh, I just want to get back to yesterday's conversation about power. Um, yesterday, uh, Jonathan Heller quoted Beck Building Krieger and said, power after all is the heart of the matter and the science of health inequities can no more shy away from this question than can physicists ignore gravity or physicians ignore pain. And he said, there's no one model for evaluation. Um, but I'm just wondering in the course of all of your work, there has definitely been engagement community engagement. You all have had uh, taken surveys, you've had learning sessions. Um, and so you've engaged the community. I'm wondering about this notion of a shift in power. Are you, is it important to you, A, to shift power? And do you think that you've been effective, you or your organization have been effective in shifting that power as so many folks think is, think is required nowadays to achieve the health equity that communities need? You know, I can use this moment to go to the, the issue about whether or not Thrive was anti-racist research, because anti-racist research and the standards for it are very different than standard DEI type initiatives. And Urban is doing a lot of DEI work on its own staff. Um, but, you know, standards for anti-racist research are very much about power and who holds the power. Um, and, you know, those standards include grounded in understanding of racist history and systems, going to root causes. There is a long section of the Thrive Report on the history of what's happened to Ward 8, because we don't want to just report, oh, here were people who were, you know, affected in the pandemic and they're in these jobs without people understanding the truly egregious things that have happened over the history of Ward 8 that have created circumstances in which folks found themselves in at the beginning of the pandemic. We can't just start, the story didn't start there. Um, it's directly, in, you know, any racist research is directly involved in social change. That's tough. The activist research, our Urban Greater DC team, which I'm part of, we sort of think of ourselves more as activist research, but we have to walk a very fine line on, line on that. And again, there's a whole other set of biases that may come in then. Um, 
But but putting power in the hands of community, with evaluation itself is powerful, right? Is putting those tools, doing the training, doing the on-the-job training, building up a cadre of community-based researchers. I feel like that's about power, um, sharing, and ultimately turning over of. Um, that's, but I'll tell you what, that, that um, subject obsesses me, I'll tell <laughs> as it does most of us nowadays. Thanks, Mary. Who else would like to respond? I, I think that um, power is, a, it's an interesting um, thought process. And I think it, it's really important. And for us and in my organization, we want Alaska Native people and American Indian people to feel empowered and um, I, I kind of grade a little bit on using that word empowered because I think every individual has power. Mm -hmm. And so to, how do you get an individual to, to recognize their power in what they can do um, and to actually increase their power? Um, and that's by engaging people in conversation and making change happen based on what they say and then giving them feedback. Okay, you told me this and this is what we did. How are we doing? Do you like that? Should we tweak it? What, what do you, what, what should we do next? And, you know, changing how we speak too. So, you know, like using for our organization, we use customer owners instead of patients because we want people to really believe that they're customers and know that they're owners of our system. Um, and it changes the whole dynamic. It changes how they communicate. It changes what they say. Um, and it also changes our employees, how they, how they treat people when they come in and what they say. So we're very aware of that, that power dynamic and we want the power within the, the people we serve um, because it actually, you know, if everybody knows their own power and is able to, to work from that platform, it actually, you know, creates um, health overall for all people um, in many facets of their life. And how do we know when we've shifted power? Um, and you know, how do we measure that? How do we understand that it's actually happened? Abby, Gloria, how do, how do you think about that? Well, in my case, uh, I have people who are asking, not necessarily asking, but just taking it on and taking the initiative and, 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 and say, I'm gonna start a committee. I'm gonna start a subcommittee on that and we're gonna figure this out. So it's easy for me to, to, to shift the power. Um, I guess it's easy at times. Sometimes I want to hold some of it to myself. But uh, in my community, we have people who are now, they are recognizing that they do have power. And we talked about the power to do. And so now we got uh, power dynamics going, going on inside the community. Like, why are you doing that instead of... Like, why can't I do that? I, you know what I'm saying? So it's it's like they want the power. They never had the power. And so to them in the community, it's so great to be able to make some decisions. In the beginning, they didn't want to make any decisions. Well, you decide, you, you, you know, you're the president or whatever. And now it's like, no, let us decide. And um, and just give give those decision making to them to let them do make the decisions. So it, it it's um uh, it's funny, because, well, I guess it's not funny, but it's, it's something to see them now competing with each other for, for power. When, it, when I first came, they all thought they didn't really have any power whatsoever. At the third time. I'm glad they've seen it. Abby? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot. I mean, it's something that we're constantly reflecting on as a foundation and um, the resources that we have uh, to bear. Um, you know, I think examples of, of power shifting are, is around decision making. And when community does make, um, for instance, early on in the Healthier Together work, one of the communities said, we're going to ask the community how to spend this money. Um, and we're going to call them mini grants. And uh, it was a moment internally where I had to do a lot of consensus building. Um, and to protect the space for community to do this to do this work, and what came out of it is now in, in all of these communities there is a highly participatory process where people with good ideas um, come uh, to each to their community and pitch it, and and it looks different in every single community, um, but the, then the community then decides um, which 
um, ideas they want to see move on. And so that seed funding is, is shared. And then the community develops ways to track progress. And we're helping um, through the wins I described um, that are very community friendly, that people can wrap their heads around, um, that does not require a paper trail. We are not interested in activities. We're interested in the wins um, and that progress. And I think over through those decision-making processes and through those safe to fail experiments. Um, and as those things gain traction, we are uh, seeing people who are becoming elected officials in their communities. Um, we're seeing uh, people bring additional, uh, attract additional resources to bear. Um, and that um, another, uh, like our local United Way contributing to that mini grant process where they said, community, we trust you, you decide. Um, are a few examples of what we've seen in that power, in, in that um, pairing, sh uh, sharing power and distributing that le leadership. Terrific, thank you. We only have a few minutes left here, but I wanna ask you one last question. And that is, this is a ses session that was supposed to be about looking at different approaches to evaluating um, uh, programs and activities oriented around health equity. And, uh, we could have gotten into specifics on how you take surveys and whether or not there was a question about whether or not uh, text surveys are better than uh, 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 oral surveys. Um, but I'm just gonna ask you one last question uh, about the kind of impact that you want to have. And Mary, I'm going to ask you this question as if you are one of the uh, coordinators of Thrive and you want to see it succeed. But looking back, uh, Let's go out five years and look back to today. In five years, what will be a measurement of success that will make you happy if achieved? Oh, wow. I'm not sure I'm going to answer this the way you're, you're uh, uh, hoping for, Arthur. But I mean, for me personally, I, as a coordinator, and I'm not a coordinator of Thrive, I'm an evaluator. I'm one of the partners. Right, we right. have the continuous feedback loop, which got us very close to things. So again, the sort of there's all kinds of biases that could have come into play. For me personally, one of the things, and this will come out in the Thrive report, is that the systems barriers, which I didn't get into as much in the way that we were able to have this unique, albeit limited window into what it looks like when you lift all the requirements and asset limits and eligibility requirements in our incredibly structurally deficient safety net that um, just puts all kinds, there's so much structural racism in the safety net requirements, it's unbelievable. So I hope that the kind of impact the guaranteed income movement is having, because as I said, we sort of even finish on the note of the report is, was cash the tool? Was cash really what was being delivered or just the tool to, live, to deliver trust, choice, and equity? And to the extent that, and I think the next generation of guaranteed income projects, I'm looking at the California guaranteed income uh, RFPs and contracting for evaluators right now, um, are gonna look deeply at these systems questions and the interaction of things like cash <laughs> versus siloed off, um, means tested, here's your food, here's your shelter, you know, here's your waiting list for those things. I hope we see in equity-based research of all kinds, impacts on how America helps people because how you help people is as important as what you offer. Great. And, and just, I'm just, sure that's what we're learning. just a sentence from each one of you, looking back five years now, from now, looking back to today, what would you like to have achieved? What would be success to you? Abby? This is such a great question. We're entering our strategic plan. And I, I would say that these networks are deepened and folks move into more traditional spaces to be part of the decision-making and that community holds power so that they, people don't need to be running after grants, that they are resourced in their blocks and in their neighborhoods and that don't have to adapt to the systems approach that we are that we are very comfortable in working in. So what does that look like at a local level and how can we protect uh, that space 
um, while those who wanna move on into the systems world, great, um, but how at a community level can they hold power in ways that make sense to them? Thank you. Uh, Gloria and Donna, can I ask you each to answer it in one sentence? <laughs> One sentence, yes. If, if you can. If we've accomplished what the community put into the strategic plan, everything that we have in that strategic plan is, is ongoing. That's what would be successful. Great. Thanks, Gloria. And Donna? It's going to be a long sentence. <laughs> so I'd like more alignment with lots of different organizations working towards uh, the same goals. I want to make certain that our health outcomes continue to be as high as they are now and actually improve in some areas where they aren't as high as we'd uh, like to see them. And I'd also like to see more American Indian, Alaska Native people involved in, in a lot of the professions, um, you know, such as being nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, doctors, researchers, um, and leaders, you know. Um, so that's what I would like in five years. Amen, amen. I could have talked to you all for another hour really to get into some some of the granularity about measurement and all of the work that you're doing. You underscored the, empower, the, the importance of power shifting and bringing in community. Your passion for it is palpable. I love the work that you're doing. Thank you so very much. If you have a chance, I know there are a lot of uh, questions in the chat that were specific to some of you all. Abby, somebody wants to know the extent that the sugar industry has been part of the West Palm County work. But in any case, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you to our audience. and. Uh, have a terrific day. Hopefully we'll get down to Drew, Mississippi before long. Yes, uh, gonna, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it back. I'm gonna turn it back to Ivory. Thanks. Thanks all. <laughs>